So I'm Robert Petrowski. I work at uh, St. Luke's as well as the Heart Health Center here locally in Grand Cayman. The, the uh, purpose of this talk is, is really twofold, maybe threefold. Uh, one, we're going to showcase the unique pathology that's uh, seen in Cayman. Most of that pathology comes through my door around 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. And, uh, and certainly our, our partners uh, know this, and, and I, I appreciate it, but maybe 3.30 on Fridays would be much better. Uh, <laughs> then we're going to demonstrate that through collaboration, and it's collaboration with our local doctors, it's collaboration with uh, our international partners, uh, we can really achieve excellence in patient care here. So without further ado, uh, our first case is a 61-year-old Canadian male, and that's not a misspelling, he's actually from Canada. That's one of the first unique things I've seen about working in Cayman, is that uh, over 100 countries are represented. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity here, and we see uh, disease from all over the world. Uh, he's a fairly healthy guy. He's got a history of obstructive sleep apnea. He's compliant with his CPAP therapy. He has hypothyroidism and GERD, and he has no cardiac history. He arrives to Grand Cayman from Canada uh, in December of 2015, and soon after his arrival, he develops acute onset of low-grade fevers, chills, nasal congestion, and a non-productive cough. Days after the cold symptoms begin, he wakes up with pleuritic chest pain, a stabbing chest pain. The pain improves slightly when he's sitting forward. He presents to his internist, and he has this EKG. So we can see sinus bradycardia. There's diffuse ST segment elevation. Then we see an AVR, a little bit of PR elevation, and we see kind of diffuse PR uh, depression in the inferior leads and everywhere else. So this is now to see if everyone's paying attention. Does anyone want to see the diagnosis? What's the diagnosis? You guys know this. This is easy. Pericarditis, very good. Normally we would say, let's see if we're right. Acute pericarditis, very good. We would say normally give that woman a cigar. Unfortunately, this is a, uh, a heart topic. We, we're not allowed to do cigars. So Dr. Baraha, on behalf of the Heart Health Center in St. Luke's, there's a case of broccoli being delivered to your house right now. So congratulations. Yeah, very simple, right? Walks like a duck, talks like a duck. Classic symptoms for pericarditis, classic EKJ. And he had no risk factors for anything else. There's no TB, there's no cancer, there's no autoimmune disease. And he's treated with a week of Celebrex, and he actually gets a little bit better. He felt well enough to go to Miami for a vacation. Now he's in Miami, and he has ongoing pleuritic chest pain. He has low energy levels. He has some nasal congestion that's still worsening. It still sounds like pericarditis. We're still walking like a duck and talking like a duck. But now he has new onset of palpitations. And that doesn't seem right. He comes back to Grand Cayman on New Year's Day, and he presents to a local hospital. And he's got this rhythm now, a little bit different. A rapid irregular heart rate consistent with atrial fibrillation. Now, this doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe we're not dealing with a duck at all. Maybe we have a zebra, right? Pericarditis traditionally does not cause atrial fib. Is there something else going on with this patient? Well, in the hospital, his rate, AFib is rate controlled with a beta blocker. His palpitations abate. He's still in atrial fib. And he's still having some pleuritic chest pain. And this is about 10 days after the initial onset of his, his uh, original symptoms. Well, your local cardiologist is sitting at home, enjoying his New Year's Day, and gets a phone call. The uh, patient is about to leave. He feels pretty good. We're going to see him as an outpatient. No need to come in. But just have a simple question. What anticoagulation do you want to use? Now, this is an interesting case. His CHADS2 score is really zero. His CHADS2 VAS score is zero. These are risk estimators for the risk of ischemic stroke with atrial fib. His has bled score, the risk of bleeding, is zero. But he's had some GI issues in the past, no bleeding. He's on uh, a PPI. But, uh, you know, just be aware of that. And then we get this little tidbit. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Ebanks for ruining my uh, New Year's Day. Uh, the patient's dad had a stroke from AFib, so just, you know, he's kind of afraid of stroke, be careful. I said, great, thanks very much. So let's think about this case logically. On one hand, 
we've got a person with a CHADS2 VAS score or a CHADS score of zero. Now this is long-term outcomes in stroke over a one-year period, very important, over a one-year period. A score of zero with the old CHADS2 gives them 0.6% per year risk of stroke. A CHADS2 VASC of zero gives them a risk of 0.2%. Remember, he's still in atrial fib. This is acute. Well, what about the other hand? We've got the ASSERT trial, which was a prospective trial of subclinical atrial fibrillation. Subclinical AF was defined as greater than 190 beats in the atrium, asymptomatic. It's a decent-sized study, 2,500 patients. They have no history of AF, and they're followed for 2.5 years. All patients, though, this is, a unique, this is a unique patient population because all of them had a pacemaker, an ICD, or a CRT implanted. And at the time of implant, they said, this is time zero. We're going to track atrial fibrillation. Because all of these devices, you can program the atrial rates, and you can have the devices detect high atrial rates. And then they found that it's not just in the one-year period. They found that episodes of AF lasting only six minutes, six minutes or more, were at increased risk of stroke or systemic embolization. And it was statistically significant. Here's other considerations we have to think about. Can we even apply the CHADS2 VAS score to this person? He has pericarditis. That, they didn't study patients with pericarditis in the CHADS. And then he also has sleep apnea, too. What do we do with that? Is he going to be at higher risk? He has an acute inflammatory state right now. Well, let's go to our guidelines, because we're in the world of evidence-based medicine, and our rock is going to be the 2014 ACCAF guidelines. They're going to show us the way, and I'll get back to my New Year's Day, no problem. Well, a class one indication for people who are thinking about cardioverting, and it's cardioverting, uh, you think this guy is going to cardiovert either spontaneously or we may cardiovert, we may, may, we may need to bring them back in a couple of weeks and do an electrical cardioversion and a TE. But anybody we're considering a cardioversion on, if they have AFib of 48 hours or more, or an unknown duration, and this is our patient, there's a class one indication for warfarin, INR of two to three, or a class two indication for one of the newer drugs, one of the, the NOAX, Pradaxa, uh, Rivaroxaban, or Eliquis. Now, it's very interesting. This is a high inflammatory state. This is a high risk of stroke early on. Why? Because irrespective of the way you, you restore your sinus rhythm, there's atrial stunning. The left atrium has the left atrial appendage. 95% of our strokes are coming from the left atrial appendage. And the left atrial appendage is a little cul-de-sac. It's a blind pouch. Why we have it, we don't know. But normally, while the rest of the heart is moving at a meter per second, the left atrial appendage is moving at 40 centimeters per second, usually in normal sinus rhythm. When you go into atrial fibrillation, that appendage slows down. The velocity goes almost to zero. And when you shock the heart, and I've done this as a fellow to, to talk about fellows training. Uh, when we're doing uh, our fellowship, we do a lot of TEs. Uh, one time, we were with an older attending who was hurrying up, hurrying up. I have to go to lunch. And he shocked the patient while we had the TE probe in. And I thought I, I was going to have to buy a TE probe. But we found out, though, that the velocity before and the velocity afterwards was completely different. Just with the shock, the velocity in the left atrial appendage went from 20 centimeters per second to zero at the initial time of shock. So this is why, because of left atrial appendage stunning, no matter what way you use to restore sinus rhythm, whether it's spontaneous, whether it's amiodarone, chemical, or whether you shock the heart, you have to be careful because four weeks afterwards and in some literature six weeks afterwards, there's a high risk of stroke. And it's irrespective of the CHAD score, okay? You could have a CHAD score of zero. You could have a CHAD score of five. This is, this is dangerous. This is, this is where the strokes are going to happen in the acute period, which means for people who are dedicating someone to cardioversion, you have to make sure that you can't interrupt the anticoagulation for at least four weeks. So very important to think about as you're planning cardioversions. Now, what if we look at cases that are similar to our, our, our patient? Because he's not really in the general public, like last slide. What about conditions that actually cause pericarditis and atrial fib? 
Well, our guidelines tell us that anticoagulation is recommended in post-MI patients. So a post-MI patient, there's a lot of inflammation there. Kind of makes sense that if they go into AFib, you should anticoagulate them. That gets a 1C level. But what about post-op? Open heart surgery, cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery. We're not going with full dose anticoagulation. We're going with aspirin, okay? There's a higher risk of bleeding. Then we have the hard place. There's actually buried in the guidelines a very specific section that says non-cardiac illness. So I said, this is it. This is going to tell me what to do. The role of anticoagulation is less clear in acute non-cardiac illness. It is likely disease-specific and needs to be addressed on the basis of risk profile and duration of atrial fib. That couldn't be more vague. Okay? It, it, nothing gives you greater pleasure than writing the $1,200 check to ACC when they're going to give you this uh, back as a guidance. So now what do we do? We also have the hard place, the legend, the little legends of cardiology. Back in early days, right, we should never anticoagulate patients in per acute pericarditis because you're going to cause acute hemorrhage. Okay? So once again, thank you very much, Sydney, for this interesting consult. Happy New Year to anticoagulate or not. Well, we're weighing the risks and benefits. Our guidelines tell us, yes, we should. And he, the patient is telling us, yes, we should. I don't want to have a stroke. I'm very worried. But then we have legend telling us there's a risk of hemorrhagic pericarditis. And he has, quote, some GI issues. What does the audience want to do? I want to phone a friend. How many people want to anticoagulate him? A couple of people there, OK. How many people don't want to anticoagulate them? Give them a little maybe aspirin, treat the pericarditis. Kind of a mixed crowd. How many people are just waiting until this is over to go to the bars? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> I'll tell you what I did. I didn't like this, and this really worried me, and I wanted to go with the patient. So I said, you know what? I didn't, I, you're not in front of me. You're walking out the door. You didn't want to stay longer. I'm going to see him in a couple of days in, in follow-up. I'm going to anticoagulate him. Something worries me. I, 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 this worried me too, and uh, it, it was really kind of a, a rough day. I went around pacing, I didn't know what to do. So after I told Sydney, go ahead, anticoagulate him, I immediately, I, didn't, I wasn't happy with that decision. And I spent the rest of the day researching, and I said, you know, if only there was a prospective trial of anticoagulation in pericardi pericarditis associated uh, atrial fib. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Wonderful. I mean, it's almost, it's amazing what Google can do. And Google will come up later in the presentation. But this was, it was literally exactly what we were looking at. And it's really by the, the guru of pericarditis. Massimo Imazio is one of the leaders in the field for pericarditis. So this is a study published in Heart, and it was really kind of under the radar. I was really shocked at how little impact and how little excitement that this study drew. Because I really think it changes the literature. And if you're into research, one of your goals should really be, can I contribute to the literature? And this, this little study did an incredible job at changing the literature. It's the largest prospective trial to date. He looked at 822 patients. They're consecutive. They all had acute pericarditis from, uh, for an eight-year time span, January to June. And this is what he found. This is not a common condition. The incidence in these 800 people was only 4% of concomitant atrial fib and atrial flutter in the setting of acute pericarditis. It occurs more frequently in older patients. Remember ours is 61 with pericardial effusion, and that certainly worried me too. I, I wanted to make sure we weren't dealing with a, a hemorrhagic pericardial, uh, pericardial effusion to start, but our, uh, the chest x-ray was clear, and Sydney assured me that there was no signs of tamponade and a fever, and he had low-grade fever. All patients with AFib or flutter were symptomatic, and the patient certainly didn't like the way he felt. Chad 2 VASC was zero in, in, uh, nine, of the, in nine patients, or 25%. AFib, A flutter appeared within 24 hours of onset in 32 patients, and it lasted more than 24 hours in a quarter of the patients. But it was transient. Spontaneous conversion to normal sinus rhythm was observed in 26 patients, three quarters of the patients. The, the conclusion was that occurrence of AFib and acute pericarditis identifies a predisposed population that will develop AFib 
and a high rate of recurrence, 35%. Now remember, this guy's got a chance too of zero. What's his risk factors? Well, his age, it's not quite Chad's level, but he's up there, he's, he's 61, he's, he's getting close to the 65 cutoff, but he also has sleep apnea. So I, I certainly think that sleep apnea is gonna play a larger role in the future of managing AFib. We're starting to see it as a risk factor, but I think the next iteration of the CHAD score, sleep apnea will definitely be in there. They also found that pericarditis in these patients acts as a trigger, and they did recommend oral anticoagulation, despite legend, and they said consider it according to the guidelines. They also found that anticoagulation is not associated with an increased risk of cardiac tamponade in the acute phase. And believe it or not, a third of all patients actually received anticoagulation, including the orals, the new orals, okay, without any complications. So they conclude, finally, an efficacious treatment of the first episode of pericarditis may prevent AFib from reoccurring, and most uh, reoccurrences of atrial fib occurred with concurrent pericarditis recurrences. So now I felt pretty good. So, you know, I couldn't have planned this better. I feel great. I did the right thing. Or did I? Patient comes to the Heart Health Center, Sir so Grand came in office. He's still fatigued. He's still having chest pain. This is about two days later from his hospitalization. He's having intermittent palpitations, and I really confirmed that his TADS2 VASC was zero. Here's his EKG now. Okay, still sinus bradycardia, still some signs of pericarditis, diffuse ST uh, elevations. But this is, he's in atrial bigeminy. This is an irritated, angry atria. So we did an echo on him. This is a parasternal long view. We have the left ventricle here, the aorta here, the left atrium here. First of all, the function looks fine. There's no effusion. We look at his left atrium, it doesn't look that big. He really is kind of a healthy guy. Look at the pericardial stripe here. This is incredible. If you look at a normal echo, you'll see the, there's free gliding of the posterior wall along the pericardium. We're getting this bright, angry looking pericardium and it's called tracking. With each movement, it's tracking, it's not sliding, okay? But this pericardium is glued to that posterior wall, okay? The right ventricle looks fine, there doesn't seem to be any valve problems, but this is, this is really the onset of the inflammation, this is the problem here. So I looked at this and then I said, let's do you know, standard views, we're, we're looking for constriction. We don't see any signs of constriction. There's a little bit of irregularity you see, it's just due to the, uh, the rhythm. But otherwise, there's no septal bounce. Normally the septum goes kind of like that, okay, when you have atrial fib, or oh, I'm sorry, when you have constriction, no sign of constriction. The atrium itself, the volume of the atrium comes out normal. This is not a guy who's a long-term afibber, okay? He doesn't have the remodeling that we see. Okay, and we're looking at the IVC, another sign of uh, constriction, and his IVC is normal, and he's almost dry at this point. It's tiny and collapsed. So let's summarize this case. We have a guy with acute viral pericarditis. It walked like a duck, it quacked like a duck, but it's behaving like a zebra now. We have ongoing symptoms of pericarditis, and we're two weeks from the onset. And this is bad, because the more inflammation you have, the more risk you are from, for developing recurrence of pericarditis, and also uh, from developing constriction. And constriction is the main thing that we want to avoid. And we did a good course of anti-inflammatories. So what's going on? So I said, all right, you know what? Based on that pericardium, based on that EKG, forget anticoagulation. You're in normal sinus now. Let's get you on good anti-inflammatories, and let's just go with that. And let's pick aspirin, because at least with a CHADS2 VASC of zero, aspirin is reasonable. And we didn't cardiovert him. He converted on his own. So I figured we, the left atrial stunning was probably low. So I started him on colchicine as well, and we'll talk about that. Now it's 0.6 BID for three months. This you have to be careful with. We actually changed it down to uh, 0.6 daily because it's weight-based, and his weight is kind of just at 70 kilos. So he lost a little weight from the uh, acute illness, and uh, we lowered the dose. But I stopped the Xeralto and started him just with prophylactic dose, aspirin 325. Now I know full well there's a high risk, uh, you need a higher dose of aspirin. But I said, well, let's up triterate, let's see how you do. And let's see if maybe we can kind of get you out of trouble. I don't want you to bleed and maybe this will be just all we need. Lucky thought. Two days later, he's already up to uh, 650 BID, okay? And he's having worsening symptoms. 
So at this point, I said I need some lab evidence. CRP is going to be a, a key uh, component of what we do. We're tracking the inflammation, and it was off the charts high. We have checked other labs, HIV, rheumatoid, ANA for lupus, all negative. I did another limited echo just to make sure we weren't developing constriction and there was no effusion. Everything looked fine, but that pericardial stripe was really angry. I doubled up his PPI. And I said, okay, we're going into the real doses here of aspirin. 650 PO TID, that's what's recommended in the studies. Plans to increase to 1,000 PO TID if no resolution, with a goal of avoiding steroids if possible. And I really, uh, I, I, I put in a, a lot of homage to the uh, please don't bleed gods. Kept saying over and over again, here's your prescription, you'll be fine, tell me if we have any bleeding. And I just kept saying, please don't bleed, please don't bleed, please don't bleed, okay? After two weeks of 650 POTID, all of his symptoms resolved. He remained in normal sinus rhythm. I did a 48 hour halter, it showed no signs of AFib, and thankfully he had no bleeding and no stroke. The CRP went from 8.3 to 0.4, and now we're doing a slow taper, decreasing by 325 each week, planning to do a stress test to rule out any coronary disease, why did he go into AFib? And then uh, I'll likely keep him on aspirin 325 for prophylaxis because the studies show a 35% recurrence in the first three months. So let's just talk briefly about pericarditis testing. All patients should get this panel. A trope is the differentiator between myopericarditis or myocarditis and just plain old pericarditis. You should not get a trope rise with pericarditis an ESR, a CBC, a CRP, at least an EKG, and all patients should get an echo and a chest X-ray. In selected patients, an ANA, a rheumatoid, blood cultures, HIV, TB, and an MRI could be very helpful if the echo is unrevealing. This is uh, from Amazio's paper on the drugs that have been studied in pericarditis. Realize the aspirin dose is incredibly high, okay? For one to two weeks and a slow taper, Use the CRP, make sure you're testing that at the initial onset, and use that to, to, to guide your therapy. And that, you know, occasional uh, checks of the CRP will tell you if this is going to come back. But very high doses of anti-inflammatories, certainly put them on a PPI. And of course, the COPE trial and the ICAP trial is where we got colchicine from, and uh, Amazio was involved in that too. Three months at least, six months if recurring, weight-based dosage, drop it down if they're less than 70 kilos. No taper, just stop at cold turkey. So case two, we've got a 77-year-old man. This, is, this time it's a Caymanian male. He's got known CAD. He had an MI in the past. He had a PCI to the LAD. And these cases are going to get a little bit trickier and a little bit more complex as we go. That's an easy Friday case. Wasn't there that late. Here comes a good one. Uh, PCI to the LAD in 2010, moderate RCA disease, but it was FFR negative, so uh, treated medically. Hyperlipidemia, hypertension that was longstanding. Now, I want to call your attention to this. Longstanding, previously uncontrolled. He says he was walking around with blood pressures in the 200s well over uh, five, six years. Luckily, he never had a stroke, wasn't compliant with his meds previously. But now he, he had a, a, a second coming. He came to his doctors and uh, was taking his medications. Um, I, my, one of my partners saw him, and he was found to have moderate calcific aortic stenosis uh, with an aortic valve area of one. So he's very close to having severe stenosis. Uh, I saw him shortly after his last echo. He felt great. He was doing well. He had no complaints. He was euvolemic, normotensive. Uh, he had his AS murmur. I made no med changes, and I said, follow up in six months. But call if you have any issues. And this is so important, OK? Telling the patient to call will empower them, because you want to make sure you're being very careful with AS patients. You have to remind them, because this is dynamic, OK? Have them call if they have any fatigue, even the slightest activity, uh, dizziness, syncope, chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal swelling, or lower extremity edema. Very, very important. Because this is data from Braunwald from 1968. We've moved the age over a little bit nowadays. But look at the survival. There's a latent period when it comes to a, uh, aortic stenosis. This is so important. As you're moving along, you can have a sudden drop off right around here. And this is when you develop the, the symptoms. And you know these patients are really walking to a cliff. They're doing fine. They're doing fine. Our job as physicians and our job as uh, you know, advocates for the patient is to catch the patient 
We don't want to catch them early. We don't benefit from operating over here. But we want to catch them right before they're going to fall off the cliff here. And we see that the three classic symptoms of severe aortic stenosis, uh, angina, syncope, and failure, and failure is the one we really worry about because the survival on average goes down to about two years, okay? Old data is still true today. So three months after his visit, the patient calls. He's feeling tired. And remember, I asked him to follow up in six months. Oh. I asked him to follow up in six months, and he's back in three months. He's feeling tired. He has subtle symptoms of shortness of breath. He returns to the clinic right away. Exams unchanged. Labs are unremarkable. Repeat the echo. Okay. Look at this aortic valve. Bright and calcified. Good LV function. Thickening walls. Look at how thick the walls are. Little pericardial effusion there. Giant atria. Okay. But that aortic valve is not moving. Okay. Now we measure. Okay. Looking at this, we get a, a, a septal thickness of 1.5. We get a posterior wall of about 1.5. This is abnormal. Normal thickness in a man should be under one, okay? Something's going on here. Is there a mechanism for this? Now, as a cardiologist, anytime we see thickness like this, we always give ourselves pause because we want to run the differential in our head. Now, remember, this patient had long-standing hypertension, poorly controlled. If you have hypertension here, the LV needs to thicken so that it can relieve the wall stress and push through that hypertension. So certainly hypertension is responsible for this level of thickening. Okay? And we wouldn't be surprised. Then if you put the aortic valve, if you put that in a chokehold here, you're going to thicken even more because you need more, you have more wall stress, thickening will relieve that wall stress. And this is not outside the realm of, you know, what we see in, in people with hypertension and severe aortic stenosis. So I'm not too surprised by this. Other things we have to think about are hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, um, athletic heart, of course he's in his uh, 60s, 70s, so probably not an athlete and then infiltrative diseases, which he had no family history of. You know, I, everything else was normal. I think we're doing okay. Not surprised by these numbers, okay? This is an apical five chamber view. Look at how calcified that aortic valve is, okay? It is just not moving, okay? Function looks good. Uh, massive left atrium here, okay? It's walking like a duck, it's quacking like a duck. I think we've got severe aortic stenosis in a patient with hypertension. No surprise there. Now this is the most important shot. From this, from this view, we get this, okay? This is, I'm gonna draw your attention up here. We're putting a continuous wave Doppler going through the left ventricular cavity and the aortic valve. This is gonna give us velocities of blood along this blue line, whether it's at the aortic valve level, whether it's at the uh, LV cavity, okay? We're gonna get the blood uh, speeds. And what we're seeing here, this first little white area, okay, is blood in the LV cavity. It's moving at less than one meter per second. It's a nice big cavity. It has plenty of room. But we see when the blood gets to this point, all of a sudden the speed picks up. And this is part of the continuity of equation. If we're gonna have flow across an area, we have to maintain that flow. And we can do one of two things. We can increase our speed or we can increase the area, okay? But there's a pressure drop across the, the valve. You see, when we have a big area, we don't need a lot of speed. When we have a tiny area, we need a lot of speed, okay? So our velocity comes up. But this is such an important view because it gives us, at simultaneously, it allows us to check ourselves. We, we look at the LV uh, speeds in a different view. But we can actually see the speed here kind of superimposed with the aortic speed. So that gives us a nice little time to check our numbers when we're at the aortic level. Now, I want to call your attention to this. This is probably the most important slide of this whole talk. Severe calcific aortic stenosis. You saw it, I saw it. That valve does not open. How do we grade aortic stenosis? Well, we do it by the valve area, okay? When we use the continuity equation, we can calculate the valve area, knowing the speed of the left ventricle, knowing the area of the left ventricle, and knowing the speed of the aorta, we can calculate and solve for the aortic valve area. Now we get a valve area that's under one, 0.84, that's consistent with severe calcific aortic stenosis. But here's the problem. The mean gradient here is low. If you take a garden hose and you suddenly occlude that garden hose with your finger, the velocities go up. The gradient goes up as well. Our velocities are not the traditional velocities that we would see with, with severe aortic stenosis. We've got kind of lower velocities than we would expect. Now why is that? 
Could it be that we're not going straight down the barrel of the aortic valve? Well, it looks like we're pretty good. But that's a big source of error if our placement uh, isn't correct. If you don't have a proper sonographer, this is a big problem. Could we measure these wrong? Certainly. But you know, it looks like everything is pretty good, and I even checked this one too, and I get the same numbers. And that's a normal distance for the blood to travel in the aortic, in the LV. And this is kind of a normal to hypernormal distance for the aortic valve. So we've got speeds, usually the cutoff is four meters per second. We're not quite there, we're close. Visually, the valve doesn't open. Something is wrong. We calculate the stroke volume, and the stroke volume is low, okay? And when we index it to his body weight, it's even lower, okay? The cutoff for normal flow is over 28. He's got 26. So how do we put this study together? We call it paradoxical low flow, and I give our stroke volume here, it's less than 28. Low gradient, not, mean gradient should be about 40. It's only 26. Severe calcific aortic stenosis. We give our valve area with a preserved ejection fraction. I said, given the discrepancy between the clinical symptoms, visual severity of the AS, and the Doppler gradients, we recommended the patient for cath. So I had the long conversation with the patient. I said, you know, it's time to go up to our friends at St. Luke's, and, you know, we're unsure. I think you need your valve replaced, but the data doesn't make sense to me, and uh, you're going to need further investigations. Now, this is a very important paper, uh, really understanding low flow versus normal gradient. I'm going to take you through these pictures here. This is normal aortic stenosis, garden variety, okay? We have a somewhat thickened LV, but a decent-sized cavity in end diastole. Look at how much area the blood has to come in, and then with systole, you can see the EF is preserved, push through. When you put a large volume of blood in, and a large volume of blood goes out, you're gonna get a decent gradient. This is our normal gradients for severe aortic stenosis. We get a valve area of about 0.7 with this one, okay? But with this, we get an end diastolic volume of 115 milliliters, normal. Um, when we can, we get a stroke volume of, thir of 70 and a stroke volume index of almost 40, okay? Now look at this side. Same thing, end diastole and systole. When we look at the wall thickness here compared to here, this is our patient. Look at how much thickening we have here. Look at how much cavity space we have here. There's not a lot of cavity. When we look at the difference, if you can't put a lot of blood in, you can't get a lot of blood out. The blood going out gives us the gradient. We still have an EF of 60%. We still have a valve area of 0.7 squared, but our mean pressure is now 28, 25, whereas here our mean pressure was 45, okay? This is a paradox. So everything is the same, but our pressure is low because we can't fit, we can't accommodate the blood because of the wall thickness. Our stroke volume is much more decreased here, okay? And our stroke volume index, when we compare for body size, is much lower. So this is a clear example of paradoxical, low flow, low gradient AS with a normal or preserved ejection fraction. This is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Well, this is our tissue Doppler. When we're talking about heart failure, we know we have systolic, how do, what about diastolic? Now, this was a kind of a dodgy echo because, uh, there, you know, he was a little bit tachycardic at times. He was moving around, and we couldn't really get a good Doppler wave across the mitral valve. But what we're looking at, again, we've got this line. We're looking at what's going on at the mitral valve. Here's the left atrium here, left ventricle here. We want the valve to open, and we're measuring the velocity of the blood coming in. And there's a characteristic pattern to normal. And what we can do is measure what's called the E. Here's our systole here. There's the QRS. So the ventricle is squeezing. So we go into diastole, and we measure from the early period, and that's this arrow, to the atrial kick. And there's a little bit of an atrial kick here. I think this was the best one we had, so we went with it. And we see that the E velocity is 97 centimeters per second. Then we tell our Doppler, I want you to forget about high velocities and look at low velocities. These are in the 10 centimeters per second range. We're not in meters per second, okay? And we want to measure diastolic function. This is a little bit off, it was a tough study, but what we're looking at is here's systole here, and we wanna see kind of the early filling. What's the early effect on the, the uh, mitral valve apparatus? And we get a velocity here. When we take the, the numbers from here and here, E and E prime, we get 97 over four, 24. Anything more than 15 is consistent with elevated LA pressure. We call this pattern 
where there's almost no contribution to the left atrium, restrictive filling. Now, why is that important? Well, it shows that the patient is, is volume overloaded. It shows for certain conditions, there may be some infiltration, okay? We referred him up to St. Luke's for, and their valve team uh, starts talking to him about uh, an aortic valve replacement. They do a repeat echo and they see the same findings that we have down here. But then the difference between here and there is they have a, a, an echo that does strain imaging. Strain is looking at longitudinal movement, okay? And I'll show you a picture here. But interestingly, and, I, and this will be very clear in a second, but the strain imaging showed globally abnormal longitudinal strain with apical sparing, something like this. So this is the heart kind of squished down. We've got the apex here. We've got the mid cavity here. And we've got the basal segments here, okay? And strain imaging has kind of revolutionized uh, some of our imaging. And, and those who are against it say, ah, oh, what's the big deal? You're going to get the same thing anyway. You don't need another parameter. I'm tired of learning numbers, okay? 20 is usually normal, and this bright red color is normal. So if we had a normal, healthy heart, you would see this all the way around. But what's curious about this heart, and remember he had CAD, so certainly, and it was in the LAD territory, he had a, a previous infarct, right? We can get these blue colors. Normally, if we're, we have a baseline, the red is showing the movement longitudinally in systole. We, change, we, we compare that to the movement in diastole, and we get these numbers. In this, this frame, the walls are moving actually away, okay, in systole. So this is abnormal, this is abnormal. Now, this isn't consistent with a myocardial infarction. This pattern, and only this pattern, where we see this apical sparing, everything is normal, 20 all the way around, but low numbers on the sides, is specific for one disease, and it's amyloidosis. So now let's go back to this. Here's a guy who's got long-standing hypertension. He walked like a duck. He had aortic stenosis. He quacked like a duck. And we had this wall thickening, 1.5 on both ends. Now you're telling me he has amyloidosis as well? We have another zebra? I don't know about that. So we did a uh, cardiac MRI up at St. Luke's. And of course, he's found to have this late gadolinium enhancement that's kind of characteristic for amyloid, okay? So we put a duck in with a zebra, and we ended up with amyloid. So now what do we do? Well, we went and did a cardiac biopsy, and it actually returned positive for senile amyloid. Now this is a big problem. Amyloid is usually not good for uh, valve replacements. It's not good for long-term uh, prognosis. And we didn't know what the tissue type was initially. Do you want to go and replace the valve on somebody who's not going to live very long? So there's a big conference, we didn't know what to do. But given his symptoms, given the fact that it, truly we thought that the aortic valve was the, the, the major player, the decision was made to replace the valve. Now let me ask you this, how do you replace a valve in somebody who's got severe diastolic dysfunction? Well, let's talk about amyloid uh, for a second. I think this is one of the nicest slides on amyloid I've ever seen. Amyloid is a disease that not a, a lot of us understand. There's many different subtypes, and I want to just spend a minute going over this slide. This is from uh, Smith. Uh, it was in a uh, circulation editorial in January. Amyloid is a protein. It's, it's a misfolded protein, and it's an infiltrative protein. We have two types of systemic amyloidosis, AL type and AA type, and two types of transthyretin amyloidosis. Transthyretin is actually a normal protein. It's found in the body. It's made by the liver. It binds to thyroxine. It binds to uh, retinol. It carries the, the other proteins. So this is a normal protein. The most shredded uh, form of AL, or the most shredded form of amyloidosis is AL. This is a plasma cell disorder. This is almost like a cancer. The plasma cells are secreting the light chains. AL for light chains. It goes into the kidneys, it goes into the heart, it goes into the liver, and it's a horrible prognosis. One to three years. The patients die off rather quickly. They get terrible autonomic dysfunction. You can't control their blood pressure. You try to take fluid off. Their pressures bottom out. It's really a horrible, horrible disease. And the treatment is no better. The chemotherapy has been the, the, the gold standard, and the success rates aren't that good sometimes. 
And if you've ever had a patient who went through a bone marrow transplant, it really is a terrible process. But what do you do if it already affected your heart? Well, at the Mayo Clinic, they're doing cardiac transplants first and then doing a, a stem cell transplant. Because if you don't fix the heart first, you can't undergo a, a stem cell transplant. And the problem is, if you've ever seen someone with a stem cell, there's, there's no way uh, that they can go through that if they have a weak heart. And if you just transplant the heart, if you don't take care of the amyloid, the new graft will shut down in a number of years as well. So AL is a horrible, horrible disease. AA is a systemic illness. It's usually an autoimmune or an inflammatory condition. And it has a much better prognosis. And you basically treat the underlying condition. Now, our patient uh, came up with senile or wild-type amyloidosis, okay? a normal protein that misfolds. Okay? How does a normal protein, if you're wild-type, misfold? That we don't understand yet. Okay? But there's a mutated protein. We see this very commonly in young African Americans, and this is a familial mutation that could be passed on. The mutated protein gives a terrible survival, and you have to do a liver transplant to fix the patients, get rid of the source of the protein. You can also do a heart transplant if it affects the heart. And recently there was a paper in the New England Journal talking about this gene mutation uh, has been identified in I think about 30% of the patients who have this. So we have a, ge a genetic test now available. But then the wild type, it's kind of a moderate prognosis. Male dominance, usually seen in elderly patients. BNP is usually up. Bad sign if the LV function goes up and increased wall thickness. So this is what our patient had. And because of the survival is pretty good, and his main symptoms were from uh, the aortic valve, we decided to replace the valve. And how did we go through all of this? This is from the same paper. When you have some, how do you diagnose amyloid? When you go through the patient with dyspnea, edema, uh, diastolic heart failure signs, okay, you do your echo, you see the increased wall thickening. If there's any question, you do a cardiac MR, okay, and you gotta figure out where am I gonna do my biopsy now? If you're at a center that does cardiac biopsies, you can do a cardiac. If not, you go for the fat pad. The staining on the boards, right? Congo red, right? Remember that? Now, once you have the, the, a positive biopsy, you have to tissue type it. You want to know, is it the AL? Because it's a different uh, treatment. Or is it the TTR, OK? So Mayo Clinic is one of the leaders in the world that does this. And they, did, they, they found that our patient had the TTR type. And then they did um, uh, isoelectric uh, sequencing, and they found out that he had the wild type. So this is the standard workup for amyloid. But I think nicely done, it's a complex disease and, and very kind of uh, algorithmic based and very easy to follow. So we had the importance of the valve team. We had a cardiology team and a CT surgery team talk with the patient. Amyloid is an infiltrative disease. It's gonna cause horrible diastolic function, and who knew what this patient's thickness was from. Was it from hypertension? Was it from aortic valve stenosis? Or was it from the amyloid? So given the amyloid doses, and even though it's the wild type and it's the one that has a better survival, the, the decision was made to avoid uh, a pump-based surgery, avoid open heart surgery, because they said, once we, we put them on, we'll never be able to get them off pump. They did a left heart cath, and it showed stable CAD and a patent stent in the LAD. And now this is an, an animation that's going to show you the TAVR procedure, okay? Now, it's not the video that's having trouble there. We're actually putting the patient into VFib, okay? What you do is you, you have a catheter, you do a balloon valvuloplasty, you crack the old valve, okay? So here is the aortic valve, and here's the TAVR sitting there. So they would have initially done a balloon valvuloplasty and break up that old valve, okay? And then they have a catheter, here's a guide wire, We've got pacing catheters in the right side. And now, when you see the heart fibrillating like this, we're trying to deploy the valve. And we want to make sure that the valve is not floating around. And if the heart is beating, every time we try to come down, we may get sized uh, off the valve, off the aortic annulus. The most important thing is to remember your coronaries are sitting here. So you can imagine what a disaster this would be if all of a sudden you deploy in a beating heart, and you think you're here, but you're actually up here because this valve is quite large and it'll occlude the coronaries and you can cause a, a large heart attack. And once you deploy it, it's, it's pretty hard to get it off. Uh, there's a video in the Mayo when they first started, they had something that looked like this, and in the next uh, film, they have something that looks like this. The valve had migrated, the heart moved, and the valve was stuck here. 
So certainly a mistake you, you want to avoid. Uh, having an aortic valve in your aorta is not helpful and causes clots, right? So we're gonna, in order to do this procedure safely, we need to stop the heart. So we pace very rapidly, you'll see there it is, the heart stops, and now we have time to actually deploy the valve. And in speaking with the TAVR doctors, I asked them the question, because I'm not an interventionalist, how much time do you have between the balloon valvuloplasty when you actually destroy the valve and the time for the catheter? And they said, you know, it's usually about 40 minutes or so, 30 minutes, we take our time, we move it up and down, to me, it's an echocardiographer's worst nightmare because you're standing there forever. Get it? You're, you're the, uh, the radiation jockey, so that's why I, I stopped doing that. Uh, but it's, it's really a tedious and, uh, procedure, and it really needs to be done right because so many bad things can happen if you're off, okay? So they start the, uh, the, the balloon valvuloplasty, and you have wide open AI, okay? And of course, this is what happened. After the balloon valvuloplasty, the patient went into cardiac standstill from the amyloid. He couldn't restart the heart, okay? They did CPR immediately, and the valve was quickly positioned correctly. And I asked them this, I said, how long did you work? If you normally have 40 minutes to work, how quickly did you get this valve while you're doing CPR? And they said 15 minutes, and it, it was incredible. So what a great testament to the team. Um, it was actually one of the first patients that I referred as a member of the St. Luke's team, uh, and you know, fortunately they didn't uh, want to kill me afterwards. It was certainly a, uh, an exciting Friday uh, for them as well. But the patient was extubated the same day. He was completely neurologically intact. Um, Postoperatively, he developed atrial fib, not surprising. He was anticoagulated with Xeralto. And based on the initial cardiac standstill, uh, we said, we're not going to try to shock him. We're not stopping your heart anymore. Now that it's beating, you just keep going. We'll keep you on Xeralto. We tried to cardiovert him with amio, but looking at that left atrial size, we weren't going to be successful. So now I see him down here and follow up one month later. Um, he says, I've never felt better, and he's working in his backyard, and he has no complaints. So a really, really amazing case set. Don't miss the patient. Um, looks like aortic stenosis, looks like high blood pressure, but another zebra kind of knocking at the door on a Friday. I want to thank you guys um, uh, for having me.